Jalisco New Generation Cartel, CJNG, and some of the good people fighting these cartels are with the DEA. Uh, Frank Tarantino is the special agent in charge for the DN, uh, DEA in our region. He joins us live here on the Dory Monson Show. Frank, really appreciate you coming on with me today. Good afternoon, Dory, and thank you for having me. My pleasure. So tell me how bad it is, because I've been looking at some of the trend lines for both fentanyl and deaths, and I know that you've been tracking these numbers. How bad is it right now? Well, you know, Dory, I think what we have to keep in mind is that uh, from a national perspective, we're seeing a pretty consistent uh, increase here in the Pacific Northwest. And let me just clarify, the Seattle Field Division encompasses the states of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska. That's what we consider the Pacific Northwest. But specifically, Washington State, we're seeing a very uh, true and accurate representation of what we're seeing on a national scale. And what we're seeing on a national scale is a significant increase unprecedented increase in overdose deaths. We're approaching 90,000 deaths. And I think it's hard sometimes to visualize or to appreciate what that looks like. But I think the best example I might be able to offer would be that's that's the equivalent of an Airbus or a jetliner crashing every single day and 250 lives perish as a result of that crash. And we've seen that now for a a consistent year time period of uh, overdose deaths in the United States. Okay, and I know you've been talking about these numbers on a national perspective, but I know that on a more specific level uh, that you've been talking about how this cartel is trying to get a foothold in Seattle. Do, Do they look at this as a particularly target-rich environment for what they're peddling? Well, there's no question that that we're seeing uh, a significant increase in the um, distribution and the smuggling of what we consider to be fentanyl-laced counterfeit prescription pills by two main cartel organizations that that, uh, reside in Mexico, the Sinaloa Cartel and, as you mentioned earlier, the CJNG. Um, both of these cartels are taking advantage of the opioid epidemic and are essentially fueling and perpetuating the opioid epidemic. And we've seen a significant increase, as you mentioned, here in Seattle. Um, in Washington State, for example, we've seized, uh, as, as an agency, 163 pounds of, of fentanyl in, in Washington State alone. That's, that's an increase. That's a, a, a 50%. I'm sorry, that's a 100% increase from, from last year. Um, wow. so, so we're seeing a, a significant spike. And then across the, the Pacific Northwest, we're seeing a 490% increase. So, so pretty significant there. Well, and when you talk about 163 pounds of fentanyl, that is a staggering amount given how little of that drug is needed to kill somebody. I mean, how, how potent is this fentanyl? So, you know, I think that's a great point that you bring up, Dory. Um, what, what's hard to appreciate is the, the very small quantity that's, that's um, needed to, to provide a, a lethal dose. So what we say in DEA is that two milligrams is enough to uh, – essentially kill somebody. And, and what, what is even more alarming is that DEA, again, on a national scale, 27% of all analyzed fentanyl-laced counterfeit pills contained a lethal dose of fentanyl. And when, I assume when we think about, I know... Th- mm-hmm. oh, go ahead. Yep, go sorry. Ahead. No, I, just, I think the other really interesting thing that, that is worth mentioning, we talk about numbers, is, is roughly a kilogram of, of NPP, which is, which is the, the chemical needed to make fentanyl, can produce about a kilogram. It's a one-to-one ratio of fentanyl. And then that same kilogram can be processed even further into a million fentanyl-laced counterfeit pills, which are then smuggled across the U.S. border and up, up the I-5 corridor right here into Seattle. 
I, I was starting to say, Agent, I, I assume I know why they're lacing these drugs with fentanyl. It is so potent, it will will produce a much deeper addiction in people. But they don't want to kill off their potential customers. But I, but I assume they're willing to kill off customers to get something that potent out there. And if people die, they just consider that to be collateral damage? Well, I think that we have to understand that the, these labs, these super labs that exist in in the uh, Sonora state uh, in Mexico in the Sinaloa cartel and CJNG areas of operation are not necessarily the same laboratories that we would see here in the United States. And, and what they're doing is they're co-opting um, chemists to serve their purposes and, and make these clandestine counterfeit pills in Mexico with very little oversight and quality control. Um, I, I'd like to add just real quickly that, you know, the United States government, specifically the Drug Enforcement Administration, which which kind of prides itself as the premier drug law enforcement agency in the world, we have 90 offices in 70 different countries, specifically 11 in Mexico alone, and one in every South American country. And we, we really work uh, on a on a day to day basis to uh, work with our host nation counterparts to cultivate bilateral investigations, meaning joint investigations, where we target um, significant drug traffickers and, and organizations in Mexico, and we hold them accountable in their own in their own country, and and then we also hold them accountable to the things that they do here in the United States. A couple other real quick questions. So, how are the the fentanyl, the heroin, how's it getting into our country? Is it just because our southern border remains so porous? Well, I think what – so the one thing that we all have to remember is that this is a – unfortunately, a very um, – uh, it's a very lucrative business for, for the traffickers, and they really have an imagination and a – unlimited resource of money and tools to get their product to the streets. And they're always trying to cultivate new customers. And I think that's why we're seeing such a significant increase is that they're trying to find areas that haven't uh, predominantly been um, hotspots for fentanyl and even meth meth production or meth distribution. But they're using all means necessary, and they use tunnels they use uh, body carriers, they use vehicles, they use um, airlines to get their, their product to market. So really they're limited by their imagination and they're limited by their resources. Um, and of course, they don't have anybody to answer to necessarily. They don't, they're not governed by a law like, like we are. And then why Seattle? There's a lot of real estate between the U.S.-Mexico border and Seattle. And I have long speculated that the fact that Washington is a sanctuary state is one reason why this is looked as a, at a path of least resistance for for getting a foothold. But do you do you know why Seattle's being targeted? You know, Dory, I don't know that it's anything different than what we're seeing across the rest of the country. It, it is so perverse this 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 widespread pandemic or this widespread epidemic, I should say, with with the fentanyl laced counterfeit pills that it's everywhere and that should concern us all as citizens and as as a parent i'm a parent of, of three children I, I worry daily about the proliferation of this of this this drug that that it's all over the street so i don't know that it's necessarily specific to seattle i think that it's it's widespread throughout throughout the country it's coming up the i-5 corridor it's a it's a perfect route for them to establish new net networks new markets and they continue to push their product uh, deeper and deeper into the into the United States. Okay, and then last thing for you, Agent, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, what role, because we have seen a record murder rate uh, for the last 30 years in Seattle and in King County. A lot of that is gang-related. Uh, do the street gangs play a role in the distribution network once the cartels get the product into the region? Well, yeah, absolutely. You're 100% on point with that, uh, Dory, that, that the, these these cartels definitely utilize street gangs in the United States to push their product. 
Um, the cartels are extremely dangerous and lawless in Mexico, and we've, we have um, attributable and actionable information of, of some of the atrocities that they've committed in furtherance of their criminal activity in Mexico. In the United States, the, the, as mentioned, the, these, these gangs, these drug gangs are pushing the product. Inherently, when you mix drugs with um, gangs, there's, there's almost always violence associated with those two things. And so when we say yeah. there's drugs, we always say there's drugs and guns, there's drugs and guns, and then there's violence. So we definitely see an increase in violence. Um, but, the, but the majority of the, of the real um, heinous crimes and atrocities that are being committed by these cartels are in Mexico, in, in some of those, those um, cartel-dominated areas of Mexico. Wow. Well, I know I speak for a lot of my listeners, like you. A lot of us are parents, and you know, God bless the men and women of the DEA and Homeland Security for the the job you do, because I know it's dangerous work on your end as well. And uh, I'd love to stay in touch and hear how how this battle evolves in the months to come. Thank you, Dory. I really do appreciate you taking a little time today to to help spread our message of remaining vigilant and, and staying engaged with our with our youth and also just being mindful of, of this really dangerous drug that's that's perverse and widespread across the, the city of Seattle and throughout the Pacific Northwest. So thank you again for your time. All right. Agent Tim.